I'm Dr. Newell Bringers, and I'm talking on Gospel Tangents. It's the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. I'm excited to continue our conversation with Craig Foster and Newell Bringhurst. We're going to talk more about modern day polygamy, especially about the growth of fundamentalist Mormons, the temple and priesthood ban, and other groups like the Apostolic United Brethren. That's Cody Brown's group. So it's going to be a fun conversation. You won't want to miss it. Check it out. <laughs> well, let's move on to volume three then. And this is uh, 1890 to the present. So. Uh, this is great because we get into get into the musters and and the all reds and those sort of people. So, right. So, give us an introduction. Well, we have some really fun essays in there, and uh, no wonder the book is is so uh, <laughs> large uh, because we uh, total number of essays. Why don't you give uh, a total two? number of essays are seventeen essays, and they have. Um, it starts with uh, Barbara Jones Brown manifestos, mixed marriages in Mexico, uh, the demise of mainstream Mormon polygamy, and then we we go into uh, John Taylor's 1886 revelation. Uh, another one that is a fun one is uh, Christopher Blythe uh, talked about uh, the one mighty and strong or. It should be the ones mighty and strong. He, <laughs> he had the one mighty and strong mess, messianism and the rise of Mormon fundamentalism. And then we have by uh, Marianne Watson, who is um, a fundamentalist and, and my co-author um, on another book that she and I did, um, uh, American Polygamy. She wrote uh, from 19th century Mormon polygamy to 20th century Mormon fundamentalism, three contemporary perspectives on John W. and Lawrence C. Woolley. And then we have uh, an essay by uh, Ken Driggs, another one that's on Rulin All Red and the Search for a Refuge by Eric Paul Rogers and Carrie Roosh. Then uh, a, an essay that Newell and I did together, Rulin and Warren Jeffs. The Making of Two FLDS Prophets and the Changing Face of Fundamentalist Mormonism. And then we have a fun one, The Changing and Unchanging Nature of Fundamentalist Mormon Clothing Styles by Shannon Spafford. And then another one that Newell and I worked on together, um, The 1980s uh, Schism Within Fundamentalist Mormonism, The Emergence of Centennial Park. And then Newell Bringhurst, uh, he did a, a good one here, the the 2008 Texas raid on the FLDS um, uh, Yearning for Zion Ranch, uh, its impact on the FLDS church and on other fundamentalist Mormons, because what a lot of people forget is that this not only affected the FLDS, but the raid the raid had a ripple effect. It, it affected all of the fundamentalists in one way or another. And uh, Newell wrote another one, The Fundamentalist Mormon Beliefs on Race and African Americans. And uh, then Joseph Lyman Jessup, who was raised in the, um, the Apostolic United Brethren, he had kind of a reminiscence, a personal perspective growing up and out of the polygamous community of Pinesdale, Montana. And then Marianne Watson had what I think, and I think you would agree, it's one of the most interesting essays in the book, Polygamous Ancestry of Contemporary Fundamentalist Mormons. And she she did a, a survey among all of these different fundamentalists uh, obviously, a lot of them didn't answer, but a number of them did, uh, asking if you, if they had uh, ancestors in the church, if they were polygamous, or who they were in in, in the LDS church. And um, it, it's just a fun one. And then I, my essay, uh, Plural Wives of the Mormon Fundamentalist Leaders. Then we have Ann Wilde um, wrote... 
Section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, a fundamentalist Mormon perspective. So ultimately, in this uh, three-volume work, we have four essays dealing with 132. And uh, just two others here, Mormon Media Stereotyping a Polygamy that I wrote, and then Pat Scott and Todd Compton did a wonderful job wrestling with the principle a historical bibliography of Mormon polygamy to to end the the series. We thought that would be a, a good way of ending it. Well, Newell, I would love to hear, I know uh, you talked a little bit about Ray, the race essay there with fundamentalism. Um, <clears throat> it's my understanding uh, that uh, a lot of fundamentalists don't recognize the LDS revelation in 1978 um, and don't like to talk about it because, um, as, as I think uh, some of the early church leaders said, nothing good can be gained <laughs> from, from talking about that. But most fundamentalists, or, or can I say all fundamentalists, pretty much still believe in a, in a priesthood ban for blacks? Yes, yes, very much so. I, that that was, one, uh, it was one of the more interesting essays, you know, kind of an extension of my interest in in the race issue which i've kind of been dabbling in for for 40 some odd years and uh, it was interesting that that virtually all of the groups uh felt that the uh, that that they went along with the uh, brigham young assertion the blacks not hold the priesthood and and uh, and they go along with the myth that it was Joseph Smith that started the practice and 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 they still hang on to all of the uh, traditional beliefs that it's because blacks were an accursed race descendants of Cain of Ham uh, and that they uh, uh, they they were uh, neutrals during the pre-existence they they still embrace all of the traditional arguments as put forth in the mainstream church uh, and, and you know that that have since been rejected and or denounced uh, you know writings that you you know the, the essence of what uh, Joseph Fielding Smith wrote in have they been uh, denounced uh, though because uh, I know a lot well, of people still believe uh, that. And, well they well, it, 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 that, that, that we go down that road, you know, in, in the mainstream church, you know, the, 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 uh, in the gospel topics essay that you interviewed us on, you know, the, the church has moved pretty much away from uh, those traditional arguments and, and that, you know, that, uh, uh, but, but that it's not true for the uh, fundamentalists. I mean, they still claim that that's a basic cornerstone of their uh, basic beliefs that set them apart from the mainstream uh, church. I, I argue basically that their belief that blacks are cursed, that they are not entitled to the priesthood, that they're uh, you know somehow an inferior race, is still in, in you know is embraced as a as a basic cornerstone by uh, the fundamentalists, almost to every group. I, I think one exception, I, I think one of the small LeBaron groups, uh, and I, I, I can't remember which LeBaron it was, that he kind of went a little bit the opposite way, but uh, the bulk of them, all of the rest, you know, the, the AUB, the uh, FLDS, all the rest of them, Independence. I mean, Ogden Kraut wrote a whole book on on affirming the legitimacy of black priesthood denial that was published after uh, the uh, seventy eight revelation, and uh, they they consider that one of the cornerstones of their unique beliefs that set them apart from the mainstream church, along with uh, the idea of the United Order, along with the idea of practicing polygamy. And the Adam God theory; those tend to be the big, major cornerstone beliefs of fundamental uh, uh, fundamental Mormonism, and they they say this is what sets us apart from the mainstream church. Yeah. Do you have anything to add on that, Craig? No. He, he did a great job of, <laughs> of explaining it. <laughs> he, he is definitely the expert on on. That topic. I, I've tried to get a few of them to talk about that. They won't. They will not talk about it on camera. I'll tell you that. Um, I, know, I know the Peterson group. They started in like April of '78, and then the 
June, two months later, the revelation came, and they were like, well, glad we got out of there in time. <laughs> um, so, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, that's, that's definitely a very touchy subject with the fundamentalists, and I don't, I personally don't think there's much of a leg to stand on. It, it's just a terrible policy. Um, <laughs> have you talked to them about, like, Lester Bush's 1973 article that, that says, hey, Joseph Smith did not institute a ban? Well, I, I've never had that discussion. Maybe you've had more interaction with the uh, with, with the fundamentalists than I have, uh, particularly the leadership within the AUB. So you could answer that question better than me. We, we've had some fun discussions, and and um, I haven't changed their mind, and they haven't changed my mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's a tough topic. Um, yes. For but I'm glad to hear that you're having conversations with them, at least. Can we talk about... It seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong here, uh, so up until Heber J. Grant in the 40s or 50s, there was kind of... The, the fundamentalist groups were very loosely organized, and it was really, like you said, under Grant, where we went after the polygamists, that that's when they started to formally organize. Is well, that, yeah, is that right? yeah, it was. It was during that. It was during the Grant era that they really started to come together with their Council of Friends, and uh, that that I think that 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 formation came about in. I think the they first talked about that the Council of Friends about twenty nine, wasn't it? You, yeah. yeah. The um, in the twenties they began to coalesce. Oh, and, so it was a little bit earlier. Yeah, a little bit before. And in the '30s, we we had the uh, uh, the Council of Friends. And was that around the same time as the Third Manifesto? Uh, yes, yeah. yes, yes. The the Third Manifesto was very much a reaction to the fact that uh, so many people who felt that plural marriage needed to be continued uh, that. Um, they had begun to coalesce around the Woolies, and uh, and so the Third Manifesto was was really specifically aimed at uh, those who were who were coalescing with that group, and there were obviously other other groups that were kind of forming in, in the same uh, time period, but. But the majority of them seem to be uh, going toward uh, the, the the Woolies, basically. And with the Council of Friends, it, it was, for the most part, quite united. Uh, but then um, we, we had the 40s. We had the 44 raid, where a number of men were put into prison. They were tried, sentenced, and went to prison. That's the Short Creek Raid you're talking about? Uh, Earlier. No, actually, it was the uh, Salt Lake Raid. Oh, okay. um, there was a Short Creek Raid in 1935 that um, <clears throat> resulted in, in a few arrests and a couple of uh, prison sentences. And then in 1944, there was a, a very well-orchestrated raid that uh, arrested, if I remember correctly, it, uh, it was at least 11 11 or 12 men and a couple of women. And, um, and then the men uh, of that, uh, at least nine of them went to prison. This is off the top of my head. So, uh, and, and they, they were serving time. You know, actually, I think it was 11 went to prison. And what happened was uh, they decided to go ahead under the direction of uh, Joseph Musser, they decided to, uh, and I might add, John Y. Uh, John Y. Barlow, both of them encouraged the men to go ahead, sign a statement that they would no longer live plural marriage, which they immediately broke um, after they got out of prison, uh, except for a couple of the men said, no, I, I would not do that. Um, I would... I would not sign. I would not... I will not sign because I would be going against uh, my oath. And uh, so they remained in prison. So that was actually the first kind of break 
because when they got out of prison, they basically said, we don't want to have anything else to do with you. And they they went independent. And then there was the priesthood split that occurred in 1951 to 52. That was the big split. And that, uh, that what uh, eventually became of that is you had Musser's group, which became the All Red Group, and you had Johnson's group, uh, which uh, uh, became eventually, it was known as the Short Creek Group or Johnson's Group for, for Leroy Johnson, Leroy Sunderland Johnson. And uh, that eventually became the FLDS and the Centennial Park Group. Okay. And that was in the 50s, you said? That was the, the, uh, the break occurred between 51 and 52. And so the interesting thing about Centennial Park and FLDS, please correct me if I'm wrong, the FLDS got into this hairstyle and clothing style, but Centennial Park, they just, they still have regular dress. Yeah, that, that, right? that, uh, that was a, yeah, that was a major split that came about in 1986. That's where they get the name Centennial Park from, is it exactly 100 years after the, uh, John Taylor revelation, which they oh. use as the uh, basis for uh, continuing fundamentalism. And the reason for the break, as you say, it, a lot of it was due to the uh, tightening control within, uh, within the group. I mean, uh, it, it, they'd been ruled by a, a seven-member council of friends, as was the case in the All Red group, you know, which continues to along that line. But but eventually, with the emergence of, uh, of Rulin Jeffs, he wanted to move toward one-man rule. And so he completely abolished the uh, seven-member council, referred to it as a, as a seven-headed hydra monster. Oh. That was the term that, uh, the, that, that uh, Rulin Jeffs used. And he said, I am the sole authority. Uh, I'm the sole priesthood authority, and uh, a group of people uh, led by Haman and by Timson, uh, who had been part of the seven-member council, they walked away and formed what became known as the uh, Centennial Group, and, uh, and, and, and they were much more, more akin to the All Reds in terms of their interaction with the larger community and and, and not, you know, saying we're, we're not going to isolate ourselves and we're not going to uh, try to make ourselves a, a, a distinctive uh, part, uh, you know, tightening of, of dress codes because that, because uh, it was interesting as, as, uh, as Shannon Spafford argues very beautifully in her essay, which I think is one of the, one of the most evocative essays in the volume. I, I, I went back and looked at it today, and she did a lot wonderful job. I might mention that's uh, Craig's uh, oldest daughter, who is just a very gifted writer. But she, oh. in, in her essay, she just did a beautiful job of showing how the, the clothing styles within the FLDS or the Short Creek group became, uh, it's almost like they were stepping back and back further into time, going right. back to 19th century prairie dresses that were in these uh, very plain uh, colors, you know, these very, and, 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 and these bizarre hairdos known uh, Described by Ofer Rimthy as the puffy thing. Uh, the puffy they, thing? I mean, uh, yeah, that's what they she the, referred to it, the puffy the thing, the puffy poof or whatever, yeah. the poofy puff. I, I said, <laughs> but anyway, uh, and and whereas uh, the uh, Centennial Park people were, they dressed modestly, you know, and because they were still wearing the long uh, temple original temple garments, and that was one of the nice things that Shannon. Uh, Spafford pointed out in her essay is that a seminal turning point in terms of the way that the fundamentalist dress as opposed to uh, mainstream Latter-day Saints was a change in the style and the cut of the temple garment which occurred in 1923 uh, because they still wear the old traditional garments long sleeves, uh, long sleeves that they wore prior to 1923 the well. all the way down yeah all the way down to the cuffs and uh, 
and 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 so e even though uh, the uh, the Centennial Park, they, they they tend to wear the longer sleeves and 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 that, but they they're more akin to what you know modest dress would be among uh, you know LDS or uh, members of society as a whole. Yeah, the the uh, the Centennial Park. Um they they do the women do still wear dresses and skirts. Um, uh, very rarely would you see them wearing pants, um, if at all. Um, so that differentiates themselves from the AUB. But uh, as Newell pointed out, um, the uh, the FLDS dress that we see. Um, uh, the, the the so-called prairie dress that that came into style with the the Jeffs with Rulin and um, Warren yeah. and Warren uh, because before that they too dressed the way that you see the Centennial Park uh, people dressing of just long dresses or skirts uh, they didn't wear pants and that was a reaction to uh, the fifty three raid actually. Yeah, because in 1953, the Shore Creek Raid that is the best known, you know, the, the well-known raid, um, by the time that all of that, all the dust settled, you know, we're into about 1955 or so, and uh, Leroy Johnson, Uncle Roy, uh, was very concerned with the influence of the outside world that had affected some of the members of their group uh, who had been, you know, they had been taken to Phoenix, were living um, in, in Phoenix and other communities uh, when they were all hauled off by the, uh, by the police. And uh, so he had kind of a retrenchment in, in which uh, they, it went overboard <laughs> to a degree because you can see photos of before the raid, or at at least at the time of the raid, and you can see some girls wearing pants. They were wearing jeans, and and long sleeve shirts, and uh, and so the women and the girls didn't all dress just in dresses and skirts. Uh, but um, uh, after they had this kind of retrenchment movement, from that point on, they dressed in just dresses and skirts. And uh, uh, Uncle Roy particularly liked uh, 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 print dresses and skirts, um, flower prints and stuff like that. And so you see a lot of them, uh, of the others, they basically wore that because they knew that's what he liked. He felt that was the most feminine. And then, you know, with Rulin Jeffs and, and Warren, then it moved to that other, as as Newell uh, pointed out, uh, the the colors are really kind of dark or drab uh, colors for working out in in the yard or other things like that, greens and browns and and uh, uh, colors of that nature, dark blues. And then when they're inside uh, or going to church or other meetings, then it would be. Uh, uh, all that rainbow of pastel colors, and and, um, and they started doing the poof again. Um, it appears that it was uh, Rule and Jeff's family that uh, had started to to do that, and then you you, you know how it is with um, that they're they're just like regular society. They see they see people they look up to or or the leadership, they start to dress a certain way and everyone else kind of follows suit. And then Warren really pushed that, uh, as Newell pointed out. It seems like Elissa Wall, <clears throat> she was the girl who basically testified against Warren Jeffs and mm -hmm. got thrown in jail. They had a big deal about red dresses, like they were slutty or I don't know what the words. Well, used, the but. red, uh, that that's an interesting thing, that whole concept of red. That was the absolute forbidden color, and uh, the uh, they they uh, they uh, nobody could wear anything that had red in it. That that was established uh, under the Jeffs, 
in uh, in 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 the FLDS, and they uh, there there was a couple of rationales for that. The major rationale was that's the color that Christ is going to re- wear when he comes back in the second coming. And uh, they also uh, looked upon red in almost a, 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 a little bit of an opposite way, that it was the color of passion or, or uh, a, a, a color of, of you, know, uh, you know, like red light district, you know, that it was somehow attached to uh, licentiousness and, and that. And the irony is what I find ironic is when Warren Jeffs was stopped and arrested when he was driving between Las Vegas and uh, back to uh, uh, Colorado City, he was arrested driving a red Escalade, Cadillac Escalade. That was the, I, 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 again, I, I love irony and that, that, that supreme <laughs> and irony. And wearing shorts and a t-shirt. Oh. <laughs> so he wasn't wearing his garments then, huh? Just like Joseph Smith. <laughs> yeah. So, um, <laughs> the, yeah, so... Uh, Alyssa's sister, Rebecca, uh, she um, she had a book that came out uh, called uh, um, uh, what was it? Um, 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 Witness in Red or Woman in Red? Um, heck, we wrote the thing, but I can't remember the, what the title of the book was. Oh, geez. Uh, the Witness wore red. That's the what it was. Witness wore red. Yeah, because there you go. Yeah, yeah. When she she was there as a consultant for uh, for law officials and for prosecution. So she was there practically every single day of, uh, of Warren's uh, trial down there in Texas. And every single day she wore a different outfit that was red because... Was that Elisa or her sister? That was Rebecca that Rebecca. wore the okay. red because she knew that that would just drive him crazy. <laughs> <laughs> So what has happened to their movement? I know he's been in jail, and uh, he's tried to excommunicate a lot of the men. And I mean, it just seems there's, like, is it dying? Is it, it dying? It, it appears to be dying. Um, uh, and there's been a real out-migration from Short Creek, um, Hilldale in Colorado City, uh, because he told the faithful followers, those left, uh, that... Uh, if they had any means to leave, they needed to leave. And so there's been a real out-migration from Short Creek to all over Utah, all over the West, uh, back to the uh, Midwest. And I understand some people have said that they've even seen uh, FLDS further east, you know, in, into, uh, the, into the South, into uh, um, you know, New England and all that, but most of them are are in a very large area of the western to midwestern United States. And uh, you you uh, uh, you had read something on that. No, I read it. I'm sorry. A, a person commented that one of his ex FLDS friends said that it's now down to about 1,500 members. Wow. Because it used to be about ten thousand. Yeah, right. ten thousand. So it's it's diminished by, uh, you know, almost it, it, they've lost eighty uh, percent of their members. Are they joining mm-hmm. other polygamous groups or LDS or just atheism or? Do it, we know? It's it's a mixed bag. They're they're um, uh, William E. Jessup that uh, we interviewed. Uh, he had a following. Uh, he had been ordained. Uh, as as bishop, but was also ordained, and you can correct me if I'm wrong on that, he was also ordained at the same time as an apostle. Um, and so, so in the he, FLDS church? The, in the FLDS. And so he said that uh, basically he had the authority since Warren had lost the authority. Uh, and um, And so... There's been a good size, well, good sized. Yeah, you know, uh, if I remember correctly, when we interviewed, it was about twelve hundred, a uh, thousand to twelve hundred. Oh, I, or is yeah, that too much? I'd, I'd forgotten it. it um, you it, said I, Warren yeah. had lost his authority. He still has the authority in prison, right? Well, but, yes, but but William E. Jessup 
said that he had lost claimed that he lost his authority. Oh, that Warren lost his authority. Yes. And it's a schismatic group. It's oh, okay. a group. It's so broken away. Yeah, sure. okay. yeah, it's broken and away. And then there are others who have just, who continue to live the principle, but are just kind of waiting for for a new leader to come along. And then there are a number of them who have just, that's it. They've, they've just kind of left altogether. Did I cover that pretty well? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, the groups that we haven't covered, and I think they're the hardest to study, are the independents. <laughs> that, like, I know Ann Wilde is an independent. Yes. And uh, the the thing that I th find so fascinating is because they're the largest group now, right? They're like ten thousand. Everybody, ten thousand seems to be the number everybody likes to climb on. Um, yeah, you know, I would think it's really hard. To to uh, estimate. to estimate a number, but I would say there are at least ten thousand, probably more, who in one way or another would be considered fundamentalist and is independent. But uh, for organized groups, I'm going to I'm going to stick my neck out, and they probably won't appreciate it. But I would say today the largest uh, organized group would be the Apostolic United Brethren. That's Cody Brown's group. Yes. Yeah, and it, it's uh, Dave Watson is the current uh, head of their uh, seven-member uh, uh, priesthood council. And, he's, he, and, 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 and his wife is Mary Ann Watson, who, who is, uh, you know, who has written. And she's my order. neighbor, right, out in Lehigh? What? Yeah, see, they used to live in Lehigh. Oh, they don't live in Lehigh they, they, they moved uh, oh. now, but so Mount yes, Pleasant. they used they, to. They, yeah, that, that was one of the interesting... Yeah. She is the uh, co-author, along with me, of American uh, Polygamy. Okay. And she is one of his wives. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Uh, and, and, and that was an interesting experience. I just relate on a personal level. I, I had never been down to Mount Pleasant where they're establishing a, a major, where they've been establishing over the years a major AUB uh, uh, settlement down there. And uh, it, it, it's interesting because it's kind of out by itself away from the main part of Mount Pleasant. And, and I had the opportunity uh, earlier this week uh, to go down there with Craig. And uh, it, it was an interesting experience for me because one of the one of the leaders down there, one of the principal families, uh, his name is it, it is okay. You want to give his name? I don't know if he would want. Yeah, that. but anyway, he, he I grew up with him. I, I I won't I won't give his name because I I'll protect his privacy. But he he grew up with me in Midvale, Utah. Oh. He lived two streets over from me, and his story is that he grew up LDS. And uh, he, we belonged to the same Boy Scout troop. He was a couple years older than me. And he ended up uh, going to Brigham Young, graduating in history, political science, ultimately became a seminary teacher for the mainstream uh, LDS church and was at the same time serving as a counselor in his bishopric. And he confronted the issue of the Adam-God theory Mm -hmm. and started looking into other aspects of uh, what the fundamentalists were, were, were teaching. He uh, met personally with uh, Rulin Allred, oh. you know, and, 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 uh, and Rulin encouraged him to stay active in his LDS ward, even though he was, you know, it's like he was caught between two worlds. I found this an absolutely fascinating story. Oh, I know, I love story it. They're like the LDS Church is the bachelor's degree, and we're the master's. Yeah, degree. I mean, the LDS Church they still consider that the legitimate church, and they consider themselves. Eventually, the two groups are going to come back together. And he has studied the theology and the doctrine. A very bright, well-educated guy. I, I, I was absolutely impressed with what he had to say. And besides, uh, you know, our, our fathers had been close friends. They had, sir, they had been, because they both had wonderful voices, they'd been in the Olympus male choir together. And uh, so our fathers had been close friends. But we, because he was two years older, I, I'd never been that close to him when we were growing up together in Midvale. But it was a surreal experience going out there and meeting with him. 
and he uh, related his religious odyssey, how he uh, went into the, uh, you know, the uh, fundamentalist movement, and, uh, and, and, and he was so proud of his family. The thing that really impressed me the most was the loving, close relationship that he had with his children. Uh, you couldn't have met a nicer, more compassionate uh, individual. Uh, and, uh, you know, as I say, it, it, was, it was kind of a surreal experience to me. Uh, and, you know, that, that he, he, had, he had had three wives, and through those three wives, he'd had 23 children, had over 100 grandchildren. He said, that was my greatest blessing, is having this large uh, uh, family. And, 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 and I mean, there's just a, there was just a wonderful feeling about this man and, and, you know, and meeting him again after all those years. We'd graduated from the same high school together and everything else. And it reminded me of the famous William Faulkner quote uh, uh, that, uh, from one of his writings called A Requiem for a Nun. The past is not dead. It's not even past. <laughs> You know, I, I will just make two notes here. <laughs> um, for any of your uh, Mount Pleasant uh, viewers. Um, it's not a huge group. Uh, it's not the major um, site. They, they, they have a nice congregation, but um, the headquarters is still in Bluffdale. And, and that's, that's the largest congregation by far, is, is uh, the Bluffdale. Do they have a temple? Uh, yes, they do. Is it um, in Bluffdale? They have a temple in Ozumba in Mexico. Oh. And, um, but don't they perform temple ordinances in the Bluffdale and, and uh, yes, facility? They do. Yeah, <laughs> they, they do have <laughs> but a, they, the, the facility for ordinances. But they do endowment say kind of a thing. it's yeah. like an endowment house. Yeah. They, they yeah. emphasize that it is not a temple, but yeah. they do have um, you know, Sacred, a facility uh, yeah, there. Right. Okay. An endowment house. Are they going to do one in Mount Pleasant? I don't think so. Oh, okay. I, I, I'll, I'll put it this way. There's nothing in the plans that I'm aware of. Now, they may be planning. They haven't told me. Why would they tell me? Yeah, you're the yeah, but that, that I'm aware of, there's, there are not any plans to build a temple there. So, and, I'm, and maybe this is giving away company secrets, but I've always been curious... And that, mostly after talking with Ann Wild, um, when you're an independent fundamentalist, how do you find somebody with the priesthood power to seal you to a, a person? It all depends upon the fundamentalist, uh, the independent fun, fundamentalist. Uh, some do not feel that they need priesthood uh, power. They feel that God will recognize their relationship, and so uh, that it might be a relationship in front of very close loved ones, uh, a ceremony. I mean, it, uh, in in front of very close loved ones, it uh, might also be just a private ceremony. Then there are other fundamentalist independents who do believe that there needs to be priesthood authority, and so some might go to. Uh, to people that they believe would have that authority, uh, be they uh, leaders within some of the other groups, uh, like the AUB or something like that. Uh, and others have feel that there are certain uh, individuals or families within the independent uh, movement there, independent fundamentalists, who uh, at least have enough priesthood power that they could uh, take care of that. But many of them did believe that they don't need that priesthood power, that God will recognize uh, what's in their hearts. Well, that sounds very Protestant. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> very Protestant, yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, um, do you want to share anything else from your American polygamy book with uh, Marianne Watson? Um, Other than the fact that we... Uh, um, we we approach this. I'm I'm a obviously I'm a believing uh, active member of uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Marianne is an active 
believing member of the Apostolic United Brethren um, and, and comes from from <laughs> the leadership of that group. Uh, uh, her father was on the council. Her grandfather was on the council, uh, etc., and so forth. And uh, so she approached it from a fundamentalist point of view, and I approached it from a, a non-fundamentalist point of view. And we, uh, you, know, you know, I said, uh, I'll respect uh, your story. And she said, I'll respect uh, the church's story. And uh, we uh, basically worked together on what we, we, we really feel good about the book. It, um, it uh, covers the history of fundamentalism. So it, it uh, has the origins and the early days of fundamentalism and the different groups uh, so we discuss the Kingstons and and their story. We discuss the LeBarons and their story, and obviously uh, those who were with uh, with the Woolies. And we discuss the priesthood split. And I kept her honest, and she kept me honest, so to speak. In other words, if I felt that. Uh, that at any point uh, the the description uh, that there was some bias there uh, in discussing other groups, I would say I think that's uh, maybe a little uh, too harsh there. I'm going to <laughs> work with this, and and uh, and she would do the same. And uh, so we we filled that as much as possible. It's it's there's always going to be bias. But we feel that as much as possible, uh, it, it's unbiased. And uh, we also discuss the warts. We discuss the warts in the FLDS, in the Kingstons, in the Petersons, in the AUB, which I might add made the previous leader very unhappy with uh, uh, both of us, but especially Marianne. Uh, unfortunately, she had to take the brunt of that uh, since I'm not a fundamentalist. But uh, we we wanted to be honest all the way across across the board, and then at the end we discussed you know why why would people choose to live this lifestyle, particularly why would women you know want to live this lifestyle? And I I personally think that the conclusion that it's a that it's a a really um, it's a pretty good chapter, I think, in trying to look at at uh, what drives them. But all the way through was the theme that obviously there's faith. Yeah, you know, they have faith that this is what God wants, and uh, and that's I think the main thing that uh, that pushes them to live a lifestyle that um, uh, even in the best of times is not easy. And uh, so, yeah. It was. It's. We enjoyed doing it. And you haven't gotten any side eyes from your bishop for studying fundamentalism. No, no. Actually, <laughs> I I haven't. Uh, in fact, uh, kind of a funny story there. We were having a party here uh, at the house, and I had invited Marianne, and uh, and uh, there was at least a good handful of other fundamentalists here, uh, here with with. With their wives, etc., oh, and um, uh, among the guests was our bishop at the time. Um, he's been released after this. No, I mean, <laughs> he he was later. You know, he was released after his five-year uh -huh. stint there. But um, he was the bishop at the time, and a fellow guest who recognized them uh, went <laughs> went over to him and said, there, "There's a there's a number of fundamentalists here." at this party and I went walking over and the bishop said I understand that there's a lot of fundamentalists here and I said yeah <laughs> and I'm thinking you know I'm thinking oh boy yeah. and I go is that a problem and he goes no should it be and I said no I don't think so <laughs> so so uh, um, they're, they're aware that I that I do research with uh, the fundamentalists and, and in the process have gained a, a number of fundamentalist friends, but so has Newell. He, 
he, he doesn't have to worry about uh, getting in trouble with the church. <laughs> but uh, but he, he too has gained some very uh, good friends who are fundamentalists and and um, we've had some great uh, great relationships and great times together. Well, I feel bad. <clears throat> you know, we got the, under the banner of heaven. Did you guys ever talk about the Lafferty's or anything in any of your books? Uh, we did not talk about the Lafferty's here. I think we may have mentioned them, but I don't think it made the final cut. Uh-huh. Uh, let me look really quickly, because I can't remember offhand. No, it did not make the... We, we ended up being way too long. Uh-huh. And uh, the publisher said, oh, we're not going to accept that. You have got to really cut. cut, cut, cut. And we did, and they ended up on the... Uh, um, we did mention Tom Green, who was an independent, oh. um, and he did make the final cut. And we, at one point, had talked about, um, we talked about David Brian Mitchell. I oh. think we even mentioned that uh, Knights of the Crystal Blade or whatever, but they, they didn't make the cut. Oh. And, um, but I think... At least part of uh, David Brian Mitchell made the cut. He was the one who kidnapped Elizabeth Smart. Yes, yeah, so let me look for uh, uh, Smart to see if uh, if she's... Yes, so he and she did make the cut. Um, uh, she being the victim, obviously. Right. But um, um, we did end up having to cut quite a bit, which we felt bad about because there was, a, there was some good stuff in there. But, mm. Just I actually t- contacted Tom Green and, and tried to get him on here, um, and he said he was still on probation and couldn't talk about it. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away. So yeah, that he did. Sad. That was that was really sad when we heard that he had passed away. Um, we we uh, would run into him at uh, book signings oh. at Benchmark, remember, and uh, and uh, you know, and I saw him on a couple of other different occasions. And, very nice guy, hmm. um, uh, you know. Certainly interesting to visit with. Yeah, I wish I could have gotten that interview. I was bummed that that one didn't work out. So, yeah. well, Newell, what are you what are you working on now? What are, what what's your next projects? Well, I'm I'm kind of concurrently working on a couple of projects. I uh, my my main focus right at the point is uh, is a biography on Eldridge Cleaver, mm. the former Black Panther. And a presidential candidate. And presidential candidate <laughs> and convert to the LDS Church in 1983. And I, I've had the fortunate opportunity to be able to interview uh, a number of the people, LDS people, uh, members of the church that were very close to him at the time. In fact, I inter- interviewed a couple who lived down in your neck of the woods uh, uh, Sonia and Dennis Peterson. Sonia happens to be a, a niece of uh, late President uh, Ezra Tack Benson. Oh. I had a wonderful interview, had a wonderful session with them yesterday, and by telephone I interviewed uh, 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 an associate, actually the son-in-law of W. Cleon Skousen, because Eldridge Cleaver ended up being a, a major spokesman with the Friedman Institute. You're and kidding so he, he became He went from being a radical Marxist Black Panther to being a conservative Mormon lecturing on behalf of the uh, uh, Friedman Institute. Like, isn't that with the John Birchers? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're very much akin to, they're not part of it, but they're, they're uh, you know, of a similar nature in wow. terms of their philosophy and beliefs and and so I, I, I uh, this is actually picking up on a project that I wrote a short article in the Journal of Mormon History that was published in back in 2002 and in the process of going through a new biography on Eldridge Cleaver I found that he had written a unpublished autobiography in which he talks about his what attracted him to the church and it was never published. It was uh, in his papers when he died, and 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 uh, and so I, I came across excerpts of this, and I and I, I was able to get a hold of a copy of, of pretty much the whole uh, portion of that autobiography, which he describes that. And that's what my spurred, sparked my interest in getting uh, 
getting back into looking at Eldridge Cleaver. And I'm also, uh, uh, I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but I'm also uh, intrigued by doing a history of uh, the Mormon History Association. Oh. Uh, a one time back, uh, back in the day, I was actually serving as official uh, historian for the Mormon History Association, and I conducted a number of interviews, I guess some 20 in number, and then I, you know, I, I gave it over to the person who succeeded me as historian, and I sort of walked away from it. But at the recent uh, Mormon History Conference up in uh, Logan, uh, they had a session, a special session, pre-conference session, in which they talked about uh, Leonard Arrington's involvement in the founding of uh, MHA and how that came about. And there's actually three big boxes of material dealing with that early period. And I, I, I ended up doing research, a couple of full days of research, and finding out how different an, uh, the organization was when it was first founded, how much smaller it was in terms of, uh, of, of, of membership, but also uh, the demographics of the membership, which was overwhelmingly male, and they had a respectable contingent of, of uh, RLDS at that time, the RLDS. They tried to include members of the RLDS. They wanted to make a broad organization that wouldn't include just people out of a, a, a Utah uh, LDS tradition, but also uh, non-Mormons non, uh, uh, who were doing Mormon history, as well as members of the uh, of, of the RLDS, now the Community of Christ, and uh, and 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 so it started out as a much smaller organization, reaching out to prof other professional organizations. It was really fledgling during these early years, and I found that fascinating. Hardly any women at all. The, mo the only charter member of MHA uh, was Jan Ships, who later became very prominent in. The organization, but I, I and 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 it, it was fascinating because uh, uh, you know now uh, and the subjects that they re they stayed deliberately away from were uh, polygamy and the issue of blacks and race in the oh. church. And at the recently concluded conference, as you're well aware, a whole bunch of papers were done on those very topics, and a large contingent of the presenters were. We're women. Right. We're women. I mean, now women have, have, have become a very dominant force within within MHA. And when it started out, it it wasn't that way at all. Well, I just had an interview with Claudia Bushman, and she talked about how it wasn't appropriate for women to attend that. So she <laughs> oh, really? She had to rely on Richard to find out what happened. So that well, I'd be interested in seeing the transcript of that interview. Because yeah. I brought up the subject of doing. Because she lamented, and in fact, the seeds of this idea of doing a, a, a comprehensive history of MHA kind of came from a conversation that I happened to, uh, happen to come upon between Claudia Bushman and uh, Patricia uh, Lynn Scott. They were lamenting the fact that, gosh, I've always done a history of, of MHA. <laughs> and uh, I got talking with them. and, and uh, so I, I brought up the idea with Claudia Bushman, and I also brought up with Tom Alexander, who likewise was a charter member of the organization yeah. when it started. Well, and they had that signature page with all those Bushman and everybody on it. Yeah, cool. well, I'll look forward. So you interviewed both Richard and, and, and Claudia. Claudia. Yeah. I, I look forward to seeing that. Yeah, I'll send you a link. Yeah, I, yeah. I really would like to see what I had to say. Yeah, yeah, it was okay. fun. Yeah. Was so fun. anyway, that's my other, I, I kind of found myself caught up in that because I'm just fascinated how the how the organization has evolved, how it changed, and how it came about. The 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 uh, I found the most interesting thing about I found out about the origins was the initial real push came from a group of BYU, young, vibrant BYU professors led by Tom Alexander, uh, 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 Richard Paul. Uh, 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 Oh, uh, Bushman was there. Yeah, really Bushman. He, the, the, there was a group of them down at BYU that were really pushing for the formation of it. MHA. Yeah, and Davis was, Bitten, I think. Yeah, pardon? Davis Bitten was another one. Yeah, yeah. He, but at, at that time, he was uh, 
uh, down at uh, down at Santa Barbara, oh. and he later came up to the University of Utah. He's never. It was a, a, my wife, in fact, had Davis Fitton as a professor, and she. But uh, but anyway, though that that was the group that was really pushing, and and then Leonard Arrington, who had all these other professional connections with the other organizations, and and kind of a networking type of guy really got the ball rolling, but it, the idea came from these BYU professors. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, yeah. fun. How about you, Craig? What are you working on? Um, I'm working on, um, excuse me, I'm working on a, uh, a helping out with uh, a manuscript that we hope will be a book um, that is a chronology of fundamentalism that was begun by Ken, Ga uh, uh, not Ken, 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 Ken Griggs, <laughs> Kenneth oh. Griggs, um, and uh, Ken, um, uh, he's had some health problems, so uh, a couple of us have kind of uh, stepped in and said, well, yeah, we, we want to help you with that. Right. So we're, we're kind of working on that, um, plus um, there's a, uh, annotated uh, diaries of um, of uh, B. Harvey Allred uh, that I told uh, Marianne that I would help on that. And then I'm working on a couple of articles, um, one of which uh, um, uh, has more to do with culture of violence because I've, I've kind of uh, uh, moved a little bit from polygamy um, and fundamentalism to uh, 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 doing a series of different um, Articles dealing with um, culture of violence. My most recent one that uh, was published near the end of last year, beginning of this year, was um, uh, published in um, what is the journal? Journal of the Wild West History Association, and and is titled "The Wrath of a Wrong Woman: uh, Ways Nineteenth Century." Century women punished wrongdoers, <laughs> and um, that was a fun one to write. And so I'm I'm working on uh, an article with that, and also a paper that I'll be presenting at John Whitmer, uh, looking at the destruction. <clears throat> excuse me. Wow, well, looking at the destruction of the Nauvoo Expositor, oh. kind of in a larger uh, historical and social context. Uh, as to um, was that out of the ordinary? Yeah, if not, how so? If so, uh, if it was um, uh, out of the ordinary, then how was it out of the ordinary? And uh, uh, to just try to put that more within a, a, a larger context of what was going on at that time. And that's been a fun one uh, to uh, do the research on. Now all I have to do is write it. Mm. So, the fun, the fun was there. Now that comes the writing, which isn't as fun. <laughs> it uh, has to be done. <laughs> All right, I have one more question for you, Craig. I know on your Facebook profile you've got a grizzly bear, and I see here at your house you've got a grizzly bear lamp. You've definitely got the grizzly bear theme. Are you a grizzly bear? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Yes, um, I, I am. What, what do they call that? You know, my identifiers is bear and bear self. <laughs> no, I'm kidding there. But um, but I do I do like bears, and um, I had begun. I had like maybe three things that dealt with bears before I got married, and my wife uh, really liked the idea, so it really took off after we got married. But. Um, we, we do have bears of one type or another in just about every room in the house. I, I've noticed that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. All right, well, did, any last words? Anything we missed here? Can you think of anything? I, I, I think we pretty well covered the basis of, uh, and, and I, I guess I express my appreciation that you've taken enough interest in <laughs> What we're what we're what we're both uh, trying to do, and uh, I applaud you for all of your previous podcasts and that. Uh, they, they, it's, it's it's a great contribution that you're making to 
the furtherance of Mormon study. So oh, I, wow. really, I really appreciate what you're doing. Well, thank you. I second that. <laughs> <laughs> I really appreciate that, Bill. And you're, you're one of my idols. I, that's why I have you on all the time. So. <laughs> so, love you, love you, both of your scholarships. So. Well, thank you so much for being here on Gospel Tangents. Really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Craig Foster and Noel Bringhurst. Craig, thank you so much for your hospitality and hosting us at your home. I really appreciate that and love the, the books you guys have come out with and are coming out with. So looking forward to that. In our next conversation, I'm excited to have Dr. Patrick Mason from Utah State University. We're going to talk about his time at Notre Dame and talk a little bit about Mormons and Catholics. Uh, yes, yeah, so Notre Dame you know, it, it, it's, it gave me the professional training I needed, but it also informed my spiritual life in lots of ways. So Notre Dame plays BYU this fall. Who are you rooting for? Notre Dame, all the way. All right. Okay. Yeah, so no, we are an Irish family. I met my, my wife there. So she's from South Texas. She was, she was there as a student, so we met. Uh, she actually, she came as a Catholic and joined the LDS Church. I had nothing to do with it. I met her at church. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, well, while well, she was there, so... No, wait a minute. Was she a Catholic at Notre Dame and converted to Mormonism? Yes. No way. Yeah. Did she didn't get kicked out of school? She did not get that kicked out. That happens at BYU, though. Know. <laughs> yeah, not, not at Notre Dame. If you like what we're doing at Gospel Tangents, please support us. Go to gospeltangents.com and you can get full interviews as well as transcripts if you'd like those. So click here to subscribe and over here you can see some of our other great videos. Thanks again.